The ultimate example, of course, is Jesus. He's facing off with that great dragon in the wilderness and the, and the enemy's talking to him and, and trying to convince him to do this and do that. And we could go into the three temptations of Christ in the wilderness and how he overcomes them by identity and sonship. All of that's worthwhile. I love teaching that. In fact, I think you can learn a lot for how to handle wildernesses by watching Jesus handle it. But the most important thing that happens to Jesus in the wilderness to me, and I felt like the Spirit showed me this a few months ago, and I've really been wrestling this out, trying to find how to land this. I think maybe I just found out where to land it. But what happens in the wilderness with Jesus is not so important of what he does while he's there. It's what he takes out of it, because that's what wildernesses teach us. What did you get out of this thing? Did you take anything from the center of this confrontation that will aid you down the road where you go? Remember Gethsemane on the night that Jesus is going to the cross and he is sweating, as it were, great drops of blood and the Father puts the cup of judgment in front of him and Jesus says, Father, if it's your will that I drink from this cup, I'll drink it. But if not, let this cup pass from me and I've got a legion of angels waiting to take me off the cross if need be. I don't have to go through this. I can just come back and be with you to the restored glory that we had before the world was hanged. Why do I need to go through this pain? I think the equipment to say yes in Gethsemane is what Jesus took out of the wilderness. Because by facing off with his enemy in the wilderness and looking it in the eye and asserting his sonship and asserting who he was and what he was going to do, it's the one thing he could hold on to when he was crushed nearly to death in Gethsemane. By the way, Gethsemane means place of the olive press. You just keep squeezing until olive oil comes out. And Jesus is getting crushed in Gethsemane until he's bleeding and sweating. And what does he have? He has a wilderness in his past. And in that past, he's overcome the enemy already by knowing who he is and taking that knowledge with him into the garden, I think is how Jesus says yes when it would have just been so easy to say no to that cup. No, I don't want to drink this cup. I don't want to do this. Let's just come back and be with you, Father. But aren't you glad he said yes to the cup that Jesus took the crushing and so the equipment to take the crushing is found in that wilderness. So Think about this. I don't know that it's about figuring out how to get out of the wilderness. I think it's about having a revelation while you're in the wilderness. I think it's learning to find him while you're there, however you possibly can. Let's read on because that's what's going to happen to Hagar. Verse 8, he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from? Where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. This is worth noting, folks. Up until this point in the story, the only way you knew Hagar's name is because the narrator told you. You didn't hear Abram say it, and you didn't hear Sarah say it, because she wasn't worth calling by name. She wasn't an equal. But when God showed up in the wilderness, the first words out of his mouth are Hagar. You know, there is nothing like hearing the sound of your own name from somebody that you respect or that you love or that you hope to love, to think they know my name. You imagine God Almighty walking into the room and looking you in the eye and saying your name. You go, how does he know? How does he know my name? You imagine Hagar, all this junk that just happened to Hagar, no one bothered to say her name. But when God comes to meet her in the middle of the wilderness, he knows her. And I, I want to guarantee you, you are well known to our father. I, I don't care what it is that you bring into your wilderness. I don't care why you're in that wilderness. You are well known to the Father. He greets you by name. He honors you by name and then asks you questions. And you have one responsibility in the middle of that wilderness. And it's to always be answering those questions. Where did I come from and where do I hope to go? It helps if I could figure out how I got here. It helps if I could figure out where I hope to go out of here. You don't have to figure that out the day you get in there. You don't have to figure that out quickly, but you do have to wrestle with where have I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? I, I've, I've been very intrigued by the questions the Bible poses. And I don't know how I miss this. I, I've, I've literally been in, in church for 44 and a half years. <laughs> now give me a few years there where I didn't know how to read. 
all right, because I was just a really little kid. But once I learned how to read, I was always reading some kind of children's Bible, some kind of Bible. I was in Sunday school and VBS and church and revival services. And so the Bible was like a, it was a real central figure in, our, in my life. It was a, it was a, a piece of the, of the puzzle. If, if you were to write the story of my life, there's no way you could write it without the literal Bible, the physical presence of that scripture. And I, I, I never caught the theme until I was in my 40s that whenever you read through the Bible, you always find the heroes being questioned by angels and by God and by the people they wrong and by the people around them that want it. You, I never caught how much the Bible asks questions. I'm, I'm working on Jonah and I'm working on what will probably be my next book on Jonah, and I just can't get past the fact that it's the only book of the Bible that ends with a question mark, because here's God at the end of the book going, shouldn't I love these people? And you end with this question hanging in the air, and no one answers it, and it doesn't get answered because it's not supposed to be answered in that book. It's supposed to be answered by you and by me, and I, I can't land on my feet. As I've been studying Jonah, I haven't been able to find good ground under that question. Shouldn't I love them? And I, I want to say yes, and, and here I'll show you how, but, but I keep finding myself incapable of putting into words what it would look like to love those unlovable Ninevites and the people that disagree with me and don't look like me and don't act like me and don't talk like me, and I can't figure out how I'm supposed to treat them in, uh, in light of how he's treated me. Oh, I get the theology of it. I know the Bible answer, but that's not good enough. There's a question hanging out there that goes, no, don't give me the Sunday school answer. Give me the Paul White answer. And, and you got to look deep inside yourself and keep that question mark hanging there. And so I see Hagar being asked, where'd you come from and where do you go? And, and I realize that I'm having to ask myself that question and that we need to ask ourselves that question and keep stirring that over. Where have I come from? And hopefully you know where you've come from and hopefully it's a great testimony and you go, I can tell you exactly where I come from and here's what God did and here's how, I, here's a revelation I had of Jesus and here's what I went through and that's when looking back becomes very valuable but it will also be a tough one to answer when you took a turn maybe you shouldn't have taken and you end up in a place you shouldn't be and you'll say, how'd I get here? And if you've learned how to be honest with the questions, then you'll be honest with that one too.